Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm going to talk specifically today about how to read uncertainty visualizations, considering all the uncertainty in the world. I think it's a good time to reflect on how to read this information. So in this new world of COVID-19, people from all around the planet are united in a new challenge. It is really the first time in human history where the immediate survival rate of our species is dependent in part by how accurately we understand visualizations with uncertainty. Unfortunately, uncertainty is one of the hardest concepts to understand, particularly when it's visualized. Now, what I'm gonna talk about today is how to read uncertainty visualizations so that you can become an informed information consumer and for everyone out there visualizing their own data so that you will know the modern approaches that can help you ensure that your audience will understand your under uncertainty visualizations as easily and effectively as possible. So I'm going to start with a domain that I have primarily worked in, which is hurricane forecasting. I'm gonna show you this forecast with three locations, locations A, B, and C. And I'd like you to answer the question for yourself, which of these locations is in extreme danger? Do you think it's A, B, and or C? And I'd like you to make the same judgment for another forecast. Do you think that A, B, and or C are in extreme danger? How about for this one? Is A, B, and or C in extreme danger? Now, if you're like the vast majority of people, you would have seen the first one and thought A is in danger, possibly B. For the middle one, you'd say A and B, maybe C. And then for the last one, you would think, of course, all three locations are likely in extreme danger. But what is actually different between these visualizations? Well, they're all based on the same modeling parameters, the same underlying data. The only thing that's different is the interval that's plotted. The one in the middle is, has a 66% confidence envelope. And this is suggesting that they're 66% confident that the actual storm will go somewhere within that white boundary. And the center black line is the most likely path that they think the hurricane will take. Now, if we look at the one over to the left, it's around a 45% confidence interval. The one on the right is around an 85% confidence interval. So that's to say that all of these visualizations are based on the same underlying data, the same forecast. The only difference is the visualization choice of where to place that confidence interval. And this is the actual forecast from Tropical Depression Laura, which is was just from last month of this year. And that the Hurricane Center actually uses the 66% confidence interval to show their, what's called the cone of uncertainty in their forecasts. Okay, here's another fantastic example from uh, COVID-19 research. And this is by a really great group and I encourage you to take a look at their website because it really does a fantastic job of illustrating different visualization approaches. I want you to focus here on the why. This is indicating the incidence of deaths. This really just means the number of deaths per day in the United States. And on the um, X, we have time plotted. Now, I'll have you focus over here and take a look at this projection, this mean projection here. Now, this is indicating a, a mean of an ensemble forecast. And what an ensemble forecast is, is there's many, many different groups that all um, create their own future forecasts for the, the COVID risk. And then they take the average of all of those different forecasts. And then you have the mean right here. So I'd like you to ask this question of the visualization. Is the COVID risk in the US decreasing, increasing, or staying the same? My interpretation of this data would be that maybe it's, staying the same or decreasing a little bit. And if we change the visualization type, we add a 50% confidence interval. Um, the interpretation might be very similar. Maybe it's kind of flat or decreasing a little bit. If we change the confidence interval and make it a 95% confidence interval, their interpretation is a little bit different. So it could be flatlining. The risk could be increasing or decreasing. But simply by changing the range that we show people, all of a sudden their interpretations start to change. Now this is one of my favorites, um, which is showing all of the different model simulations, all of the model forecasts. 
And the nice thing about showing the data in this way is that it allows a visual system, which is the, the mind-eye connection, to start to find patterns in the data. And what we do automatically, because we're such good pattern finders, is we try to find where most of the models are grouped together. So we have an indication of where the likely path is and where the possible um, spread of outcomes could be. We can also plot that with the 95% confidence intervals, and it gives us a massive range of uncertainty, which gives us a very different perception of the possible outcomes. Now, if we compare the two uh, most extreme approaches, the mean version to the, the version with all the models and the 95% confidence intervals, what I'd like to point out is that if you're shown just one of these visualizations, you are going to come to a very different conclusion than if you see the other visualization. And unfortunately, we're in a situation where when we see this information on the news, we're really just shown one. It's a very rare circumstance that you have this beautiful dashboard that allows you to play with the different techniques. Usually we're just shown one. And the specific choice of how to visualize the uncertainty will have a massive effect on how we evaluate our own risk. And this is just a choice. Designers could have made a different choice, which would lead to different actions by the public. The way that uncertainty is presented has a profound influence on our judgments. Now I'm going to use this figure to help me walk through some of the most modern visualization techniques. This is a figure from our forthcoming review chapter on uncertainty visualization uh, by myself, Matthew Kay, and Jessica Holman. I'm gonna focus on this left side of the figure because these visual uh, encoding properties are a little bit trickier to understand, so I think it'll be good to focus the talk on the ones that are um, more new and, and a little bit more complex. Let's begin first with intervals and ratios. Now here we have two intervals. These happen to be 95% confidence intervals. Um, and if you see these two visualizations, you might think, well, they look pretty similar. They're not exactly the same, but maybe they're based on very similar data sets or even the same data set. Well, you would be wrong. They're both based on very different data sets. The top one is a normal distribution. The bottom one is bimodal distribution. And when you see these intervals, they can hide important features in the data. They're averaging over space and just showing you end bars and a mean. So you don't actually see what the full distribution of the data looks like which can be a problem if your assumptions about the data don't match what the data actually looks like. So here's a version of confidence intervals, and here is the distribution that it's based on. Now, if you're a viewer and you're seeing these confidence intervals, there's some things that you should be cued onto immediately. You want to look very closely at the figure caption to determine what it's actually communicating to you. This is a 95% confidence interval, but it could be less, it could be 85%, it could be 33%. You know, we saw examples that I just showed you of real world visualizations using 66%, 95%, 50%. So you need to know what interval is being communicated to you so you can understand the distribution more effectively. Also, there's different statistics that are being communicated with these intervals. And unless you have taken a stats class, might be hard to know the meaningful difference between a confidence interval and standard error, for example. So there's lots of problems with using these visualizations to communicate to the general public, as illustrated by this example here, where we simply change the confidence interval and we lead to very different interpretations of the data. But why is this? It's because intervals create conceptual categories in the mind. Our mind is so attuned to creating categories and organizing information. For example, we put a fence around our house to indicate that our property is different than all of the other property. We are uh, a, a species of people that like to organize and classify information. One of my favorite quotes comes from Barbara Tversky. She writes, framing a picture is a way of saying that what is inside the picture has a different status than what is outside of the picture. And that's what we do when we're seeing these intervals. We use the metaphor of uh, containment and think that 
The information inside the brackets has a different status than outside of the brackets, but that's not true. It's continuous. The brackets themselves are just uh, a choice of where to delineate the information. There's no true difference in information inside and outside of the brackets, but we feel as if the designers are trying to communicate something categorical to us, that there's a danger zone or a safe zone, and they have figured that out and they put the brackets there in a meaningful way. But the edges of these intervals are not always as considered as, as you'd like them to be. Okay, so that is intervals and ratios. Let's move on to these more distributional types of information. One way to avoid the errors with intervals and ratios is to simply show more distributional information. So I'm gonna use this toy data set and this is a simulated data set with 10,000 values in it. On the left column, you see the numbers in my data set. It ranges from negative two to 12. And on the right column, you see the um, number of times each of those numbers occur in the data set. For example, five uh, happens 2,033 times within my 10,000 item data set. Now, if we take this data set and we turn it on its side, it starts to look like a histogram. Many of you probably know what a histogram is, um, but I want to be very clear on how these distributions are made, so I'm going to walk through this very slowly. This is a histogram representing the exact same information as my, um, my columns that are, that are stacked like that, and you read it very similarly. You can look at any value and you can figure out the frequency or the number of times it occurs. So five again is in my uh, data set 2033 times. Now you can take this histogram and you can add sort of a smoothing curve over it. You can use a statistical function called a kernel density function and kind of create a curve, which actually makes a probability density plot that we have seen in the past. Now um, the data set that I'm using doesn't have uncertainty in it. I simulated it, I know exactly what the values are, but you can do make a statistical model to make a very similar type of distribution and you could sample from that distribution to make things like this density plot here. And the interpretation is very similar to the histogram where the, the highest values represent the most representation in the distribution. And you can think about it as if you were to try to figure out where the actual mean, the center of this distribution is, it is most likely to be around five because that's the highest value, but there is some uncertainty. Okay, so that's actually the first part of this hybrid approach, which is a probability density plot plus uh, interval plot. And I want to move now over to a violin plot, which is a very interesting method. To make a violin plot, you simply take your probability density plot and you reflect it. Done. Um, the interpretation is very similar, where the area that is the widest represents the most likely or has the highest representation in your data set. And you can do things like plot a center line to indicate the mean of, of that distribution. Now, most times you actually see these violin plots plotted horizontally. So don't be confused if you see it uh, vertical versus horizontal. Um, generally, you see it kind of done in this way. Um, so there's some really seminal work that I'm going to point out. I'm going to feature some papers in this talk that do not represent all of the work. There's a large body of work on these topics, but I'm gonna highlight what I would consider some seminal work on this topic. And you can look at our review paper to see um, the, all of the research summarized. But I'd like to point out this particular study. What they did is they compared violin plots to bar charts, box plots, and a gradient plot that I'll talk about in just a second. And the reason I consider this seminal work is it was um, one of the, I think the best examples of demonstrating how these distributional types of plots outperform summary plots. So both the violin plot and the gradient plot outperformed the bar chart and the modified box plot. And um, this is an indication that it's very helpful to show people the underlying distribution, not just a summary, but to kind of give them a sense of what the data really looks like, and that can help them make better judgments. Now, this gradient plot, I'd like to point out, is very, very similar to the violin plot. It has a very similar interpretation. For the violin plot, the widest area is the most likely, 
and for the gradient plot, the darkest area is the most likely. Everything else about the interpretation is the same. And when you're deciding which one of these visualization techniques to use, you should consider a few things. For the comparison between the two, the biggest difference is how easy it is to look up a specific value in the plot. Our visual system is very good at looking at positional changes like this. So we can determine width fairly accurately. It is not very good at looking at relative um, darkness of a value. That is harder for us. So if you want someone to look up a value in your plot, I would go with the violin plot. If you want someone to just get an impression of the uncertainty, a gradient plot might be um, a successful approach. Okay, now let's move on to quantile dot plots. I'm going to use this metaphor of a Galton board to help you kind of visualize what's happening. So this is a Galton board. What is happening is this researcher is pouring these marbles into the top of the board. They're hitting these different pegs and then they fall into slats at the bottom of the board, which actually creates a normal distribution, which is fantastic. It looks very similar to the histogram that we've already seen before. And the quantile dot plot borrows that metaphor very, very highly of these stacked dots to indicate the highest likelihood. So the more dots that are stacked, those are areas that have highest representation in the distribution. And if we compare this quantile dot plot to a density plot that we've already talked about, let's try to do a task. Let's ask a question of this particular data. So the question I'm gonna ask is, what is the probability that the temperature will be 32 degrees Fahrenheit, sorry, I didn't have time to do the conversion, but 32 degrees Fahrenheit or below. If we were to start with the density plot, we would have to figure out how much area of the distribution is represented here in the, in the darker color. That would require us to do an integral under the curve. We can do this mathematically. It's not trivial to do. It is very, very hard to do visually, almost impossible to look at this and to visually extract the integral under the curve <laughs> uh, because it's a you know, complex mathematic topic. But for the quantile dot plot, if we know that each of those dots represents a 5% probability, there's 20 total dots, so each represents five, we can simply count up the dots. We could go you know, five, 10, 15%, and then 32 is between those two stack stacks. So we could say, the likelihood of the temperature being 32 degrees or below is between 15 and 20 percent. Now is that actually correct? This is a more complex plot that shows how this quantile dot plot is created. Here I'll have you focus on this cumulative probability. It ranges from 0 to 100. This is the probability space, so it's, it's continuous. See how all of the lines that delineate are equally spaced. And what we do is then we want to map that onto a distribution. So we do it with this cumulative distribution function. So what that looks like, if two lines are projected onto the cumulative distribution function, then they become more narrow if they're around the center of the um, cumulative probability. Similarly, if they're on the outside of the probability, when they're mapped onto this curvy line here, they are more separated. And that's because of the shape of the curvy line. It is more steep in some places and more flat, which allows this mapping to happen appropriately. Okay, that's a kind of a long-winded description um, to simply suggest that with this plot, we can look at 32 degrees and sort of work backwards to determine the exact probability of the temperature being 32 degrees or below, and it's 16%, which is fantastic. That is very close to what we said. We said between 15 and 20 percent. Um, the thing I'd like to point out is we didn't have to care about all of this math. We didn't have to care about how the visualization was made. All we had to do is count dots. So this is a fantastic example of a visualization taking something very complex and allowing people to use a strategy that makes sense to them, simply count up the dots, and to extract a complex probability with a very easy strategy. And this has been compared to a variety of other visualization techniques. And they find that the quantile dot plot does in fact support reasoning 
helps task performance in a variety of ways. And multiple follow-up studies have confirmed this comparing to other visualizations as well. When we look at these two types of distributional information, what are the real differences? Well, what we find in cognitive science and psychology that's now being applied to visualization is that frequency is easier to understand than probability. When I say frequency, what I'm saying is if we think about information in terms of one out of 10 rather than 10%, that's more intuitive for us to grasp because we experience frequency in our daily lives more so than probability. For example, when I drive to work, there's two routes and five out of 10 times, one of my routes has traffic on it. I don't always think, you know, there's a 50% likelihood that routes are gonna have traffic. I might think, you know, four out of seven days a week, there's traffic. That's a more intuitive way for me to understand that. And that has been confirmed by a whole massive body of research in cognitive science and psychology that we think about probability in terms of frequencies. Now there's a variety of visualizations that capitalize on frequency framing. There are these ones highlighted here. And I want to just briefly talk about these icon arrays. Icon arrays are a little different than the distributions we've talked about so far. And what they do is they communicate just a single value, not a distribution, but they use this frequency framing, which is why I'm pointing them out. So this icon array is telling us that there's 20% chance of something happening. Two of these little figures are different than, than the rest of them, than the other 10. So that's a 20% chance. And the reason why it's helpful to look at two out of 10 versus 20% is that work finds roughly 20% of college educated people, college educated people, not the average public, incorrectly answer the question, which represents a larger risk, 1%, 5%, or 10%. So there is a, a substantial proportion of the population that has a very hard time with numerical probability. But when you represent the same information visualized in these icon arrays, they can get it. They can see that three great people are, is less than five great people. That is intuitive for them to understand but it's harder when that information is communicated numerically. And this is particularly useful in a healthcare context, which is where it has been studied the most. Okay, let's move on to hypothetical outcome plots. If the Galton board is the quantile dot plot with all of the, the dots, then a hypothetical outcome plot is where you just drop one of the balls into your Galton board. It's a, a single sample from a distribution. What we're seeing here is figures from this paper where what they are showing you is individual samples from a model that are animated. So each tick, each movement of those lines is an individual pull from the model. It's one ball being dropped, each one of those. And as you see all of these animations, you are really forced in your mind to kind of build up the understanding of uncertainty. If we look at our toy example here, as you see the dot moving around, you see kind of multiple ranges of, of options. There's a full spread of where this data could come from, but then the dot is kind of in the center more. <laughs> so you get this interpretation that there are areas that are more likely, but there's also a spread. If we compare this to the, the interval that I've been harping on <laughs> this entire talk. There's some things that the hypothetical outcome plot does very well. So first of all, it does not have any type of conceptual categorization. There's no category that the hypothetical outcome plot is communicating where there absolutely is with the, the interval. And I think a really important one is that it doesn't allow you to ignore or dismiss the uncertainty. When you're seeing all of these samples from the distribution, there is no way to avoid the fact that there are many different outcomes. When you see an interval, people tend to focus on the mean, focus on the range, and they're not thinking that there's possible other outcomes happening, but that's, um, that's the, uh, that is not what happens when you see a hypothetical outcome plot. So this is my um, final concept that I wanna give you, which is that if given the opportunity, people will dismiss 
the uncertainty. And what do I mean by opportunity? Really any type of static summary. So that is a range, that is a mean, that is air bars, box plots, all of these give people the opportunity to dismiss the uncertainty. And just to follow up on the hypothetical outcome plot, these have been tested against other visualization techniques, in particular the uh, violin plot, and they've been found to outperform those. And subsequent work suggests that they're a very strong visualization choice. Okay, we'll move on to my final visualization, and this is actually my favorite, an ensemble plot. So here you're going to see an animation created by my collaborators, which is quite similar to the process for the hypothetical outcome plot. This is a hurricane forecast, and this is the model used by the National Hurricane Center. And each of these lines are actually one pull from the model. They make small changes to the parameters of the model, and then they sample, sample, sample um, pulls from the distribution, and then plot them in this animation. So each of the lines represents a single pull from the model. With the hypothetical outcome plot, you only see one at a time. Here they're kind of stacked up, so you get kind of a mental representation of the most likely path that the hurricane will take, which is where all these lines are grouped over and over and over. And when you see the um, outliers that go around and hit Florida or Cuba, it's fairly intuitive that they're outliers. They're one of thousands of these lines that are mostly grouped in the same area. So this is a version of an ensemble plot for hurricane forecasts. Now we've compared this ensemble to the cone of uncertainty, which is the current method used by the National Hurricane Center, and a version of a cone with blurry or fuzzy lines. And what we have people do is we show them different locations on the map. Here's examples of the locations. We show them one at a time and ask them to rate the damage that would occur to one of those locations. And when we have people do this for these two cone versions, people rate higher damage in these areas because they are mentally understanding these as a category, a danger zone, and areas outside are safe. But with the ensemble, people give highest damage ratings towards the middle and decreasing damage ratings up to the side, which is indicative of them understanding the distribution of information that it's intended to communicate. The other issue that we have with these two cone type versions is that people think they represent the size of the storm growing over time. The cone appears to be getting larger. It, the pixels are physically getting larger. And so what happens is that people, rather than mapping that growing cone to uncertainty in the direction of the storm path, they map it onto something easier, like size. It's very intuitive to think size on a physical map represents size, of course. That's what we're taught when we see maps, that there's a legend and you can go around and physically measure the size on a map to approximate the size in the real world. Now, in order to get these right, you have to take the physical pixel width of the cone and then map it onto something abstract like uncertainty. And that process is very difficult. But given the opportunity, people will dismiss the uncertainty. That's what we find here, that they substitute the uncertainty growing for the size growing, and a variety of other research finds that as well. Now this is a improved version that my collaborators created of the ensemble plot. In figure A here, this is what many ensembles tend to look like. When you randomly pull samples, they can look kind of crazy with these, with these lines, and they've been derogatorily termed spaghetti plots. Um, so what my collaborators did was to find a way to recreate, reconstruct the paths so that there's good separation between all the lines, meaning that they're spread out well and that they more effectively visually communicate the distribution. And when you do that, when you spread the lines out, you don't need as many lines to communicate the distribution and that allows you to make the lines thicker. So in the middle figure, what they were able to do is make the lines thicker and that allowed them to add the intensity of the storm with color and then the size of the storm with these glyphs indicating little circles that show the size of the storm. And in a study, we found that people can very effectively understand the direction of the storm, the intensity of the storm, and the size of the storm when done 
in this way and it's all intuitive. There's not lots of description that people need to understand this type of display. Okay, my take home points here are that the way that uncertainty is presented has a profound influence on our judgments. I've shown you many examples of that. I hope I've really proven to you that that is absolutely the case. Intervals create conceptual categories. Anytime we see these ranges or intervals, even if we know that we shouldn't think of them as categories, it is hard for us to avoid that metaphor that we've experienced through our lives. So it's likely that when you show people continuous data that is broken down in categories with intervals, they potentially will come to the wrong conclusions about that data. Frequency is easier to understand than probability. When you're visualizing your own work, I would recommend if you can try to find a frequency framing if that works for your application. Frequency framing, um, there's not as many developed, so it can be harder to figure out how to apply frequency framing, framing to your own data. If you can, give it a shot. If not, um, probability will be better than an interval, at least. And last, if given the opportunity, people will dismiss the uncertainty. And honestly, that's very understandable. We live in a very uncertain right now where people are making lots of complex decisions with data and um, really under a lot of risk and pressure. So if they can reduce their own uncomfortable feeling based on um, not dealing with the uncertainty, kind of imagining it as something else or using a different strategy, likely will, and that is understandable. So if you need people to understand the uncertainty in your data, make sure that you use a visualization technique that is sort of um, allowing them to confront it and not encouraging them to dismiss it. With that, I'd like to thank all my collaborators, in particular, Matthew Kay and Jessica Holman, who are the co-authors on this review chapter. You can find a preprint on my website. I'm accepting graduate students for the fall of 2021. So if you know anyone who wants to study uncertainty visualization more, particularly how brain processes information, encourage them to me. There's my Twitter handle or you can on my website. Uh, with that, I'm happy to open it up to questions.